that uh, Assam has a great, maybe, very serious problem. But the most serious problem appears to me to be total ineptitude and incompetence of the present government. The present government is committed less to the people of Assam than to some than to some vested uh, interests from outside the state. Now I don't have to mention them, people will understand what I mean by that. And as a result, their intervention or solution to those problems appears to bedevil that problem more. And in this they think less of the, the probable benefit or loss of the natives here than to the than to the people or the vested interest to whom they are committed. As a result, the problems get worse and worse. As an example, I might cite the enormous jet of water that inundated the Kargoli, a section of Kargoli Hills, an inhabited area, and uh, from a leak in the in a 10 foot pipe, 10 meter, 10 foot, 10 foot diameter pipe of the Gamon. Well, water supply system. This jet or geyser have already cost one life and there may be one or two, one, two or three more with casualties. And uh, it has made houses, it drowned houses, filled them with mud and water. And uh, there is that, uh, you know, hundreds of people are living in shelters of SRDF. So this is an example of their irresponsible the incompetence and general mismanagement of things. This is just an example. And the next, the kind of side, it's a, it's a, it's a total financial publicity publish of the government. It just goes on spending money thoughtlessly for the benefit of the of their masters and they don't think of the ultimate cost to the government and to the people of Assam. So they borrow more and more and sending the finances of the state more and more into the red. This is a result of their financial irresponsibility and which is the mark of their general incompetence. You have asked a very serious but many sided and complex question. It has many aspects and to deal with it fairly, it will take at least one hour. I can't spend so much time on it now. But let me put it this way. First of all, perhaps I am not so confident to deal with the problem because the course of English literature or English at the university level, in my college and postgraduate level, is vastly different from the courses that we had read and uh, done researching. English now gains 
War literature is the English language. Mm. And I, for myself, don't think it's a very wise decision to replace English with war literature in English. Because this uh, lands the students in some sort of confusion. There are too many countries involved, too many different cultures. They are masterpieces. And it is very difficult to grasp the essence of these masterpieces in a short period of, say, uh, three or four, five years, mm. including a postgraduate course. And if you want to go complete the course or not, briefly, in the stage of graduation, or say for two or three years, it's simply impossible. It is impossible because there are too many different cultures, too many different uh, languages, too many different words. And the uh, students who have just completed the higher secondary stage are in, are, are in total confusion to make sense of all that. When we studied English literature, when we studied English, studying English literature, at that time, even after BA degree, people like us were not really competent to pronounce on the various classics that we were made to study. But we could manage, just about manage. And then when they proceeded to the MA class courses, then we began to be able to learn. But now we have a situation where, you know, fresh graduates, fresh uh, sophomores from uh, higher secondary stage, they are bombarded with a lot of theory and world classics and so on. So I think it's a very unwise syllabus and it just simply burdens students with a lot of things they cannot make sense of. This is one reason why it is becoming unpopular. And secondly, it is obvious that English has lost. English as spoken, studied and practiced in England is much less important because of the downfall of the British Empire. Now, America is much more powerful. And uh, however, it doesn't matter because we, we, we don't have to study even American literature. It is English as a language of communication among different communities and cultures in the world. But even then, if you want to study the literature of the world in English language, four years, two, two years, three years, four years are simply not enough because of the reason I have cited about. That is the reason. And second question you have asked is, what is the second question? Lot of it, uh, uh, from what uh, the English literature to standard, what you can do? Well, standard, there may be one or two brilliant students who may have, may be able to master all of them. But the rest of it depends on uh, parroting, mm -hmm. simply ingesting something from books and parroting them in the examination. And this uh, is certainly most unwelcome, unwelcome, they become confused and uh, they have to depend on Google I think, to answer questions. And as a result, you cannot say they have grasped them about something which they are studying. So I, I think, you know, with the exception of one or two brilliant students, for most of the students it is simply you know, memorizing certain things. And memorizing is not understanding. I think, 
right up to our generation and little later uh, there was no such intellectual vacuum or intellectual poverty not that we have to world standard but we could just keep up but for the last uh, 20 or 30 years especially after the Assam movement it seems to me the standards have declined horribly. Back in 70 or 71, I remember in one man one an incident. I had gone on a kind of tour visiting villages in North Kamrup in Assam. Sort of Mandali I found that the word for that and I found that I higher secondary students at that time. It was called pre-university. <coughs> they were so fast on their, you know, their thinking. So resourceful, so original. It struck me that you see, our students are quite bright. They might not stand in examinations, that's a different matter. But are quite smart, well informed, sharp. And of course, some of them are quite brilliant. I talked to them in Gandhi, I talked to them about Marxism. And some of the questions they asked me, I had no answer. Just so the questions were so smart. So you see, that was different. People could think of them on their own not simply memorize. But nowadays we have come to a point where, you know, even MS students cannot ask such questions. And I think there are some movement had a lot to do with it because it did not care at all for education standards. We should remember one thing. When the, when the Vietnam War was going on, the Vietnamese freedom fighters, they were fighting a war. But they were quite sinless, not like our students, uh, student leaders, the people who were backing them from behind. They themselves are not very good students. And other is that, you know, neither they nor their guardians were behind them, manipulating them. They did not, they, 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 neither of them cared for education at all. As a result, in Vietnam War, the freedom fighters, they held classes when there was respite from war. When the war there was a period of rest or love of war, the young people, the younger people, they will be, they will get all their informal classroom. They will be teachers. Every one of them will be in their freedom story. They are so serious. Whether they were here or in this, and school system almost broke down. There were undeclared holidays for months, weeks and months. And people lost all interest in studies because they talked was the movement was successful, everything will be automatically, you know, cured and get better. This was a very foolish idea and it cost us a lot. And uh, also, I think, you know, from that time, because the was some interest in education, the quality of education in our schools and colleges the state of our schools and colleges did not concern the ruling classes of Asana at all. They declined, declined sharply. And those sharp, uh, you see, members, adult members of the movement, they secretly sent their, their own wards to Delhi to study. That's how. Their children did not suffer, but they were a small part of the population. They suffered 
असाध्य सफल I think the research scholars themselves, they, I think, you know, uh, two authorities are responsible for it. First, the educational authorities, and secondly, the authorities of society, society itself. They are to blame for the situation. The society itself doesn't care about education values, about intellectual standards. They have no idea because uh, all sorts of books are getting out. Everyone will be being praised. That is, there is nobody who has written a bad book. Well, we know from our experience that thousands of good books are getting written and praised in disguise. And even some good books are flawed because the writer has not worked seriously enough. These people in a, in Bengal, for example, people will immediately notice, and they will point it out, and something will be done about it. Whereas we don't have such an atmosphere, no? and the education the authorities and themselves will begin blame because, unfortunately, most of our education also do not care for education. They they take it as a kind of career. Education is merely a career, not as a vocation, not as something that should very deeply interest one, and that should, uh, you know, be something to one dedicates one's life to. It's not a vocation; it's just a sort of career, a money-making business. So once a student gets his PhD, he has the chance to land a job. Uh, once he lands at a book as for his PhD, 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 PhD thesis, even a student himself doesn't care. Mm -hmm. So whether it is printed or not, doesn't matter. And if it is printed or not, nobody can see whether it is valuable or not. I have seen many theses, especially in Assamese, modern Indian languages were just rotten. They were not worth the paper on which it was written. Very bad. They should not be given PhD, should not have been given PhD at all. But I will not tell the students because, you know, I'm certain that constraints of courtesy. But, you know, all kinds of trash is being written in the name of thesis. That's one reason. And probably some of the students knew and refrained from publishing them. Uh, and that those who did not know that they were there writing just non stuff and nonsense, they go on publishing it. And nobody turns and hair. Hey, hey. This is the problem. And uh, I think the best of the thesis should be published. And in the reports, the examiner should write that this is a book worth publishing. And the students should be specially encouraged to publish it. But the rest of them, they, they, they should be clearly written. Yeah, this is not bad, but this is not worth publishing. Unless revise, consider it. See, my opinion is uh, not very popular or it will not be welcome to many people. But my view is that the first and most serious objective of, of politics now is to replace the present BJP government somehow. It was because it is destroying democracy and wrecking 
all democratic institutions. And as a result, it will lead to a state of India, a condition of India, where people will be poor, ignorant, and completely manipulated. Maybe they will sort of, they might descend from the level of animal, human beings to animals. This is, this is the kind of fear I have. So it is vital for opposition parties to get together to defeat BJP and replace the government so that an alternative government can be formed, which can repair the damage the BJP has done and put the nation back on the path of progress. I think the evils of present day society, the evils everybody is suffering from, you, me, everybody, say like rising costs, unemployment, heavily indebted governments, mm -hmm. everything proceeds from the capitalist structure of society. Everything. Not that the capitalism is the same everywhere, or it has been the same everywhere. It is developing and it is becoming more damaging, more destructive. For example, the ex reckless exploitation of nature. In my view, the only political ideology can make, which can make sense of this is leftist ideology. They know the nature of capitalism. They know how to oppose it. They know they have a goal to replace it. I'm not just adjust with capitalism and try to go on. So there is always a future for the left, provided people take it up. The present decline of the leftist parties are because of a very uh, uncreative bureaucratic attitude toward the vast change that has come over the world today. In 1990, I think, when the 1990 when Russia, Soviet Union collapsed, after that there should have been a very serious post-mortem of the event by the socialist parties, the left. The Soviet Union by and large was a socialist state, leftist state. What happened then? How could it collapse so suddenly and without money and being anticipated by most people? Some people did anticipate, but most people didn't. And after that, serious reform of party structure, party ideology, should have taken place. This was not undertaken by any serious leftist party. They were at that time quite strong, so they felt the strength would remain. But the collapse of the Soviet Union you know, left such a mark on people's mind. And the enemy of socialism, the rightist forces, drowned the whole world in such a massive tsunami of propaganda. And if Soviet Union itself is a failed experiment, that uh, socialism is a, it leads us nowhere, it is bound to lead to collapse, so that common people no longer have any interest in that ideology, which was a kind of disaster, and which is a kind of a result of a very, very clever, systematic, and billion dollar industry of the capitalists to defame and demonize the Soviet Union and the socialist system. For example, if you read this literature, they will make you feel the socialist society was just a kind of hell. We don't know actually what happened. We are told 
facts are selected to give that impression. There are certain drawbacks, certain serious errors, no doubt. But Soviet society is not all that bad. People have had enough to eat, enough to dress, and they could uh, have good pay, recreation facilities, cultural facilities. All this is forgotten. So most people who, who are, say, past uh, 50, were in their 60s, they recall the days of Soviet Union. And they say, Russians, Russians say that, yes, social system is better. 90% of the people in their 60s now say that we have had an experience of good system. We think the social system is better. So when people don't know this. People are told that social system was hell. It was repressive, it was discriminatory, and it was uh, terribly sort of, you know, uh, sunk in poverty and ignorance. You see, no? In Russia, you can think of a present situation. Health examination, medical care, were totally free. If you went abroad and fell ill, you didn't have to spare any money in Russia. They could cure you again if you visited Russia. In America, I had fallen ill, I had no incidents. But for a small thing, I had to pay 50 pounds. So, people central people in America had no health insurance. Therefore, they cannot think of go to going to America. The doctor's fees are so high. One hundred dollars. That means now eight thousand rupees is the fees of the doctor. Which are ideal nation according to you? But an ideal nation. So can you give an example of an ideal nation in your opinion, I mean right now, in your present scenario? At the moment there is no ideal nation. Because uh, some nations are accepting socialism, but they are very much damaged already by the capitalist system that have gone equal. So that they have not been able to do much about human welfare, human development. But at least they are mitigating, mitigating the suffering caused by. For example, we have high cost of living, the cost of health care, cost of education. This is much less, much less almost free in those countries than in so advanced countries. I'll give that down. There is a tremendous long cycle on the coast of America. I think it is uh, New Orleans or something. New Orleans. The city. And people have an advanced warning. Advance warning of about one month. The terrible storm is coming. We will withdraw and find something secure and safe. So the richer people immediately then they bought land and houses everywhere. There are some common people, they had nowhere to go. They have the houses. So they tried to prepare for the storm by building planks around the house, as strongly as possible. And if they were living inside a fort, when a storm came, it destroyed those houses, almost like packs of currency. It was just scattered and swiftly when it leaked. And the huge wave of water swept. Unofficially, 
about one night they don't have crevasse. He died there. And that's just one night. And they could not be saved. Their property and they lost them. And the government did nothing about it. They didn't care. We had one day, this gun death. They said that there is freedom of individual in, in, in America. So when we told you, so then left. Why do you give them? How do these people go? Well, they under like you. So they thought maybe it's going to come and pass. Then we gave your heads and we gave money. Nobody told how serious or great the thing is. They must leave if they wanted to leave. They must leave if they wanted to leave. They had no sudden, there was no such message. They said the storm is coming. So we prepare and we draw. Realize this. Whereas in Cuba, a very small communist country, 40,000 people were in danger. All of them were rescued. Not a single life was lost. Nobody takes you home. Say that Cuba is a theoretical state. It's a precedent between the rights. This man, 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 man. But actually, imagine 49,000 people were affected. All of them were less. And Cuba is a much poorer country. Much less than Now, in socialism, the state cares for lives, saving lives, individuals. Whereas in America, where they dealt in individual dignity, the state does not care for them. Actually, the system of democracy now is hag-ridden by capitalism. There is a great overwhelming force that controls our lives, and who we all pretend, which we all pretend is not there. We all pretend that there is no capitalism, that human dignity, and so on and so forth. And then, as you know, the Tremendous, horrifying crimes that are taking place, almost daily. And uh, even 10 or 20 years back, people never realized that, never under thought, never dreamt that such heinous job deeds could be committed. Infants being murdered, gay, and all kinds of abuse, and drugs, all kinds of violent crimes, friends murdering friends, parents murdering children, children murdering parents. What What is this result of? It is a result of the mindset, mentality that arises in a society where violence is not outlawed. Why? Because competition is driving force. Everyone must compete against everyone, everyone else. So much competition that we cease to care about other people. We become totally selfish. And this mindset is being reinforced by television, by films. In films, the leading motive is revenge. 